OK, so let's start. So we'll start a new chapter today. It's a uh, three. And that will be super fields and super space. <coughs> OK. The idea is as follows. Uh, so far, we have been only talking about uh, one particle states, so just describing the states that we are dealing with in terms, and putting them in terms of uh, supersymmetry multiples. So, so far, just the super multiples in terms of uh, one particle states. In the, as, uh, in the case of field theory, that is not enough. Of course, we have, we can start describing what the particles are. So we we'll describe the particles as representations of the Poincaré group, and in our case now, as representations of the of the super Poincaré algebra. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> then, uh, but we need to talk about the interactions of uh, between the particles, and for that, we need to have a field theory, which is supersymmetric. Okay. So, so, in some sense, we have we have only like the characters of the play, but we need to know how they interact. We need to know the play itself. So, <clears throat> the goal we, we is to find a supersymmetric field theory Describing interactions. Okay, so that's that's our goal. And uh, <clears throat> so for that, we have to recall what we know from standard field theories. So from standard field theories, we know the following. We we know that uh, uh, the particles are described by fields. Phi, which are functions of uh, the space-time coordinates. So here we, the, we have, say, for a four-dimensional field theory, this is the four-dimensional space-time. And the fields can be of many types, depending on how they transform under the Poincaré group. So they can be uh, scalars, or uh, vector objects, or spinorial, and so on. So this uh, is field transforming. under the Poincaré group, or under the Lorentz group. OK? So depending on how it transforms, it will be a different type of field. So what we want to, know, to do now is to make a supersymmetric generalization of this. So that means that we'll have to find a field that transforms accordingly on the supersymmetry. And it will be a function of coordinates. And these coordinates will not be just four dimensional space time, but it will be what we call superspace. That will include space time plus something else. Okay, so that's 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 the idea. That's where we're going. Okay. <clears throat> so we want. Phi, supposing of say capital X, and this transforms on 
on their uh, Super Poincaré. And this will be coordinates. It will include the space time, but it will be a bigger space, and that's what we will call super space. Okay. So first of all, then we have to define what super space is. So that's we have to have a definition of what the super space is and how to describe it. So what is super space? A way to define a space or a space time is, uh, is through symmetries again. Remember, we have used symmetries for many things. Uh, in the first lecture, I told you how useful the symmetries were in general. We have been using them in the last uh, few lectures just by defining the particles in terms of uh, symmetries, or more multiples of particles also in terms of symmetries. And uh, here, what I will use is to use symmetries also to define spaces. It's something that we also know. And we know that because uh, we know that because uh, we know that uh, symmetry groups or uh, continuous groups define a manifold. So let's start with that. Let's start with what we know. <clears throat> we know that every continuous group, Lie group, any continuous group defines a manifold. That means that this, if I have, there's like a mapping, say, between the group G to a manifold M, such that the elements of the group G equals e to the i alpha A T A, where T are the generators and alpha are the parameters, we map The, the set of parameters will be coordinates in this manifold. Okay. And that is how we, the group itself defines the manifold. The manifold will be the manifold of the corresponding parameters of the continuous uh, Lie group. I'm sure you are familiar with this uh, concept, I'm sure. Or yes? No? Yep. More or less. Okay, so we will use that. Uh, one thing is that the, the dimension, the dimensionality of this space will correspond to the dimension of the group because there, are, there will be as many parameters as generators of the group. So the dimension of the manifold M will be equal to the dimension of the, of the group. I will call this M, M sub G, to see that it's attached to, to G. And that's, as I told you, is the number of parameters of the group. <coughs> OK. OK, so let me give you some examples. And then we'll start building up from it. Example, the simplest case, of course, is uh, the group G1, uh, U1. So G equals to U1. <coughs> That's the first case. In this case, we know that uh, every element G is equal to e to the i alpha times Q, where Q is a charge generator and alpha is a parameter, where alpha say, goes from, uh, from uh, 0 to 2 pi. So 
So we know that this group defines a manifold, and the manifold is the manifold of the alphas. And what kind of manifold it is? It's a, it's a circle. Okay. And you one. It's a circle because where we have we go from zero to two pi, but we also identify two pi and zero, so the, we have the, the interval, and then we join zero and two pi, and that makes a circle. So I'm, I'm building up this idea, just in case some of you may not be familiar, totally familiar with it, and I think it's useful. Okay. The next example. is g to be SU2. And from here, we know that one way of parametrizing an SU2 element is uh, through a set of uh, matrices that I can write P, Q, Q star, and P star, with the condition that uh, the determinant is 1, so it's P square plus Q square equals 1. And if we, we, we write p equals to x1 plus i x2 and q equals to x3 plus i x4, this implies that we have sum over the xi square from 1 to 4 equals to 1. And uh, this implies that the corresponding manifold for SU2 is the Three sphere. Okay. Actually, this is uh, on the on the argument that I, I mentioned at the beginning of the uh, course that uh, SU two is a simply connected manifold, and it means that because SU two is essentially S three, and S three is a simply connected manifold, and uh, <coughs> that's. Why, for instance, SU2 is the, the covering group of SO3, of the rotation group. Now that I say that, go to another example. G is SL2C, where now we can write G equals to H times V, where V is an SU2 element, and H is Hermitian. I'm positive, and this is actually the what I mentioned in the previous lecture, that this is the, the polar decomposition of, of, a, of a matrix. And uh, of course, uh, if the determinant is one, the determinant of each of, the, the, of each of these two matrices is also one. And so you can see then that uh, the manifold corresponding to SL2C, it will be the manifold corresponding to SU2, which is the three sphere times the manifold corresponding to H. But H, we can write, since it is Hermitian, we can write H to be <clears throat> say x mu sigma mu where and uh, you, you can uh, well so this will be x0 plus x3 x1 plus ix2 x1 minus ix2 and x0 minus x3 and so the terminal of h equal to 1 implies that we have x0 square minus sum of the xi square equals to 1, when i now goes to 3. And this is a, a uh, hyperbolic, like a hyperbole in four dimensions. And this, this is like R3. So then SL2C, the corresponding manifold is R3 
times the three sphere. Again, since each of the two manifolds is uh, simply connected, we know that the manifold for SL2C is simply connected. And this, again, illustrates what I had said at the beginning of the lecture, that SL2C is, is the covering group of the Lorentz group. OK. But if you want to continue with this, uh, <coughs> For instance, you want to define uh, the two-sphere. Ha we have the three-sphere is, is a group manifold, but the two-sphere may or may not be a group manifold. And actually, it is not. And uh, so there are more general ways of defining manifolds, uh, and it is through what is the cosets. And the cosets are, uh, and who doesn't know what a coset is? Who, who knows what a coset is? OK, it's more or less. So a coset is essentially, we take any element of G and identify it with the element of, a, with the G times H, where H is an element of capital H. <coughs> and so that means that, that, uh, that we are essentially taking all, all the elements in G, which are not in H, it's essentially. We are making equivalent, equivalent classes of elements in G. So all the elements of G related by G times H will be considered a single one. And that, that uh, simplifies. Uh, Things, for instance, uh, an example. Uh, G over H to be, say, U1 cross U1 divided by U1. So G is U1 square and H is U1. In this case, <coughs> an element of G can be written, written as e to the i alpha 1 q1 plus alpha 2 q2, and take the u1 to be one of the two, say the first u1. So let me just take, call this u1 1, u1 2, and then I call this u1 1. It's the same u1. So h will be e to the i beta q1. So that means that, that uh, when you, we do the, the quotient, essentially we are identifying all the elements in G uh, of, of this type. Any, any GH and we are identifying that with G, that means that, that by <coughs> uh, adjusting alpha 1 and beta, we can uh, essentially get rid of, uh, of this part. And at the end, the ratio, I mean, the coset is essentially what the, the notation means, that u1 cr cross u2 over u1 will be essentially this uh, u2, 1. So just to give you a, A picture here. So this is, uh, for instance, alpha 1, and this is alpha 2. So this is uh, 0, 2 pi, and this is 2 pi again. And uh, <coughs> So I take, for instance, uh, for one value of alpha 2, let me just see if I have a, for one value of alpha 2, I know that alpha 1 
<coughs> alpha 1 can take uh, this value, this value, this value, and this value, and all, all of these values of alpha 1 will be identified with one, one of them. And that means that at the end, so this is uh, I define G with GH is an equivalence relation, so it defines an equivalence classes, an equivalence class, and then you pick a representative of the class, which will be one of them. And from that, you have alpha 2 taking a any of the values. So at the end, this will give us u1, 2. Okay? So that's, that's, that's the, 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 the simple way that to, to to describe it in the sense that we are setting all these values of alpha 1 to just one single, where you just identify all of them with themselves, and then that will give you uh, that the total group will be just uh, uh, the u2, 1. Okay. Okay, but then there are other examples. SU2 over u1 happens to be S2, the two sphere, and so on. So you can have, you can use this idea of cosets to define many, many manifolds. Of course, not all the manifolds are cosets, but there are, uh, many can be defined in this way. And in particular, we can define uh, Minkowski space time as a coset. So the coset, say, of the Poincare group. over the Lorentz group, we can see that the Poincare group will have uh, as uh, parameters the omega mu nu that multiply n, n mu nu in the, of the Lorentz groups, and the a mu, which multiply the x mu, say, of the translation group, whereas the Lorentz group has only the parameters omega mu nu. So that means that in this coset, we can eliminate by identification the parameters omega mu nu, and this will give us a mu. And a mu, we can just identify with the coordinates x mu, and this is equal to the Minkowski space time. OK? So Minkowski space-time can be defined in terms of a symmetry. Given the symmetries of Poincaré and Lorentz, you take the coset, and that's a way of defining what Minkowski space-time is. Okay. So as I, as I told you, we have used the symmetries of the Poincaré group to define a particle, and now we are using it to define even the, our space-time, which is it's very nice to see how powerful the symmetries can be. Sorry, it isn't so yeah. in this case. Well, no, 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 you have to. No, no, exactly. You have to, to do it, but it, it, it is like that. Yes. I mean, it's, this is, of course, I give you a simple example just to get the, the idea, and then doing this is, is, is uh, you have to, to, to go through it. So, yeah. but it, it, but it is, it is the case. So essentially, the point is that you eliminate all, all, all the elements within the, the Lorentz group of that. But you're right. So the Lorentz and the and the translations do not commute. So it's not it's not just a, a direct product. Yes. It is a semi-direct product. What it's called. But, uh, but uh, the result is, is valid. So at the end, the ratio is, the coset is such that at the end, you are left only with these uh, parameters, with the AMUs. How do you know it's space-time? Well, thank you. Yeah, very good question. It's because it, it's, these AMUs are precisely the AMUs that, uh, that uh, transform on the translation. So it's just, imagine just take, start with zero and translate. In, 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 in the Minkowski space time. So a mu is essentially has the properties of the x mu. So it's just a, uh, uh, yes. Good questions, good questions. <clears throat> okay, so this is it. So that get, gives us already the, the, the step to define what uh, superspace is. So that what will be a superspace? So so the n equals to 1 superspace
n equals to 1 super space will be the, the, the ratio of uh, super Poincare divided by a Lorentz, which again, this will have omega mu nu, a mu, theta alphas, and theta bar alpha dots, whereas this one will have the omega mu nu. And this thing will give us a mu, which we have defined as the coordinates in our space time. And, uh, and then the theta alphas and theta alpha, theta bar, alpha dot. OK? So this is super space. And I'm defining at n equals to one super space because then I will have the 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 set of thetas. The theta thetas will not carry an analysis. Question? Yes. Well, we have to find the superconcurrent algebra, but uh, is there also a superconcurrent group? That's a very good question. Also, you in principle you can exponentiate. Because it's not a usual. It's, it's it's not a usual. Yes, that, that that's a good question. Uh, let, let me just elaborate on that. In principle, we will say that an element of the Poincare group should be like something like that, e to the i, and then we'll have uh, omega mu nu, a mu nu, plus a mu p mu. And these objects, of course, are bosonic. So in some sense, then we will expect to have this to be theta alpha q alpha plus theta bar alpha dot q bar alpha dot, for instance. OK. So this is a, a way that we can say, well, the parameters will be omega a theta and theta bar. OK. And uh, so you will say, well, usually my algebra will be an algebra only of Qs and Q bars, which will be anti-commutators and not commutators. But if you, combine, if you put together the, qu the quantity theta Q, since it is bosonic, then you can re uh, rewrite that in terms of a commutator algebra. Let me see if I have something. <coughs> Yes. So for instance, you can write the algebra Q alpha, Q bar alpha dot. So we know it's to sigma alpha alpha dot P mu. This implies that we can have theta alpha alpha, theta bar, beta dot, q bar, beta dot. And this will be 2 theta alpha, sigma mu, alpha, beta dot, theta bar, beta dot, p mu. OK? Yes, so in that sense, you reduce the anti-commutators to commutators once you, you put the parameters 
together with this. So that, that's, 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 a, that's a, a way to deal with this general element. So now we can deal with this as if it were a normal algebra with commutators once we, we, we introduce the, the parameters theta and theta bar. <coughs> Notice that to make, a, uh, <coughs> to make products of, of this, of this uh, quantities, this kind of quantities, we always have to use this uh, baker hasdorff uh, campbell formula that is, uh, it, remember it used uh, be, uh, what? Forgot the name. Uh, Baker uh, Hausdorff Campbell formula, which is e to the a, e to the b is equal to e to the a plus b plus one half a b plus dot dot dot. Excuse me? Yeah, the Grassmann. Yeah, the Grassmann. That's the thing. That, that's why we have, so theta, theta times q becomes a normal bosonic object. Because they are both Grassmannian, so they, uh, they are both Grassmann numbers. So that's why you, we can, at the end, this, this object is a, 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 a no, no longer a Grassmann object, not this one. So that's why we have to, we can use commutators and not anti-commutators. Okay. Very good. So now that you mentioned that, Look at what we have as my definition of superspace. Definition of superspace is Minkowski. So this is Minkowski. Plus some anti-commuting uh, coordinates. Okay. So remember that this course is about uh, supersymmetry and extra dimensions. So this is the first time you see extra dimensions. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there are extra dimensions in supersymmetry already. So we have the standard bosonic dimensions, but we have extra dimensions, which will be uh, four actually, because alpha and alpha dot take uh, values of one to two. And so you have two of these and two of those. So we'll have four anti-commuting uh, dimensions. So we have uh, four commuting and four anti-commuting. And so, one way to see if we discover supersymmetry eventually is so we will be seeing new dimensions of space times, but they will be like a fermionic kind of dimensions and not the standard dimensions we are talking about. Of course, at the end of the course, we will talk about extra bosonic dimensions also, but that will take us some time. Okay. So now we have these coordinates, theta and theta bar, and we will have to explode the properties of these coordinates to see what, what, uh, how is it that we can deal with uh, functions of thetas and theta bars that we are not used to. We are used to functions of, of uh, x coordinates, of uh, bosonic coordinates, but no, we are not used to functions of theta coordinates, uh, theta variables. So let's, uh, let's uh, start discussing about that. Okay, so properties. <coughs> properties of these uh, uh, theta coordinates. <coughs> hmm. For this, uh, <coughs> these are usually called Berezan. This is usually uh, it's a book on field theory by the Russian physicist uh, Berezan. <coughs> and he, he discusses a lot these uh, properties of, uh, of anti-commuting coordinates. Uh, there is also a beautiful book by uh, Bryce DeWitt.
uh, who unfortunately just uh, passed away last year. Uh, his book is called Super Manifolds. And that uh, tells you everything you need or ever want to know about uh, uh, manifolds of, of uh, anti-commuting uh, variables and, and their functions. So this is a very, very nice treatment. Uh, <clears throat> I had the, the privilege to take the precisely the first course he gave with, based on this uh, on these ideas, and and it's a nice book to read. So it's it's, it's nice. You can see how you can define in general a number, taking the part the, the, in terms of commuting and anti-commuting parts and so on. So it's it's very nice. Um, yes. So that's that's a uh, that's for the references also. Also, for uh, uh, as a information superspace was introduced by Salam and Strad B in 1974. Just uh, interesting for two reasons. Salam is the same Salam of uh, the standard model, so he was still active uh, into supersymmetry. And uh, he and Sestradi introduced the idea of superspace in 1974. Look at what I told you that the uh, supersymmetry started to be considered as a field theory precisely in 1974 by Wes and Zumino. So this was very, very, very fast after the Wes Zumino papers, they came out with this idea of the superspace. OK, enough for, for uh, historical comments. And then let me just start talking about the properties of uh, of this uh, uh, coordinates theta and theta bar. So for simplicity, let's start just with one single theta parameter first. Okay. So let's write, let's try to write uh, <coughs> If we have the function of a variable, we usually can write it as, a, as an infinite series, as an infinite uh, Taylor expansion. So let's write a function of theta and try to write uh, an infinite series as, uh, of f as a function of theta. So we, we can write the first term will be a constant independent of theta. The second term will be f1 times theta The next term will be f2 times theta squared. But theta squared is 0, because it's anti-commuting. So this is it. So the most general function of one single theta variable is linear. Okay? So that's a, like a paradise for a lot of mathematicians. So it's just something like, imagine that the most general function being the linear function. So it's, it's beautiful. So. Most general. So it stops. The expansion stops, in the case of one variable, only at the uh, second term. OK, so that's the first property. <coughs> then we can take the derivative df by d theta. df by d theta, since f, the most general f is of this type, df by d theta, this part doesn't depend on theta, so it's 0, so it's just f1. Okay. So we know the derivative of a function. Uh, so now we did all the, all the, uh, what is it? The analytic functions already, we did all, all analysis already in this line. We did the, the differential calculus on this line, so now let's do integral calculus on this other line. For integral, <coughs> we define to be the, the integral of uh, d theta, so times uh, df d theta, just to be, or I mean the integral of df. We will, this is just a definition. This, this will be the analog of the, uh, of the definite integral on a space without boundary. 
So we just go and come back to the same point. So this will be zero. So it's a, it's a statement saying that you just take no boundary. So you go, you integrate from one place and don't come back to the same point. That's, that's essentially what, what this is uh, trying to define. So in general, okay. So in particular, the integral of d theta equals zero. So since the most general function will be a linear, so we know that the integral of d theta is 0. So the only thing we need to know is what the integral of theta d theta is. So the, and in that case, then we'll, f we'll, we'll go out for the whole thing. So the integral of theta d theta, it cannot be 0, because otherwise we will get the integral of every function to be 0. So since it is different from 0, we just normalize it and normalize it to be 1. Okay, not that this, these are definitions. So this is normalization. Okay. Because then it, it will be, it has no properties than the integral. The integral will be, the integral of everything will be zero. So we just impose this to keep it. Just to keep it non-trivial, yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Just to keep it non-trivial. <coughs> okay, so uh, notice then that if the integral of something equals to one, that something for us is a delta function. So that means that uh, we now define, have a generalized definition of the delta function, the, the direct del delta function, to be just theta. Delta theta equals to theta. So that's a delta function. So Dirac will be happy to know that his delta function is just a simple linear thing. <clears throat> so now let's take then the integral of d theta f of theta. So we know f of theta is f0 plus f1. Uh, yes. Hmm. <laughs> sorry, I uh, sorry about this. The definition is like this: the theta theta equals to one. I I don't think this is very important, but I better keep with my conventions in my notes. d theta theta equals to 1. Yes, sorry about that. So d theta f of theta is d theta f0 plus f1 theta. And f0 is just a number. And the integral of d theta we know is 0. Is zero. And the integral of d theta times theta is 1. So this is equal to f1. And f1, look at that. f1 happened to be also the derivative of df by d theta. OK. So here, the derivative and the integral are the same thing, OK? <laughs> Which is also a very curious property, OK? So you take a function, you take derivative, take the integral of that. That will give you the same result. Uh, so it's this kind of anti-intuitive Things happen for this uh, for this uh, manifold for this uh, space. So, <clears throat> and then that was for the case of one single theta. So let me just try to finish the next uh, five minutes and describe it for <coughs> for more theta's.
So I, I started, I did all that for one single theta, and I will do it for several. <clears throat> First to recall, recall that theta theta was defined to be theta alpha, theta alpha. Theta bar, theta bar was defined to be theta bar alpha dot, theta bar alpha dot, with a contraction in the opposite direction. So then um, theta alpha, theta beta, According to this notation, it's minus a half epsilon alpha beta theta theta and theta bar alpha dot theta bar beta dot equals one half. Theta bar theta bar. You can just play with this by just the properties of the epsilons and, and, the, and the contractions. <coughs> so we can take derivative. The theta beta by the theta alpha, that's delta alpha beta. <coughs> d theta bar, but d theta bar, beta dot, alpha dot, is delta beta dot, alpha dot. And the integrals <coughs> I'll just finish in a couple of minutes. <coughs> Since we know that uh, d theta 1, d theta 2, theta 2, theta 1, that is 1, because the integral of d theta 2, theta 2 is 1, and then the integral of d theta 1, theta 1 is also 1. We can write, and uh, since theta 2, theta 1 is 1 half theta theta, so that means that uh, the integral of one half d theta one, d theta two, theta theta equals to one. And then by definition, this is what we will define as d two theta. And just a definition, just to say that the, in the integral of d two theta, theta theta is one. Okay. Just uh, playing with the, with the one halves. <coughs> Also, if you write in terms of, of uh, epsilons, d2 theta will be minus one quarter, because epsilon, you, you do it twice, then you have d theta alpha, d theta beta, epsilon alpha beta, and d2 theta bar. Uh, it's a similar definition. D theta bar alpha, D theta bar beta, epsilon alpha beta, dot. And uh, of course, from here we can have that D to theta, theta theta equals to one, as I say there. And then we can have d2 theta, d2 theta bar, theta theta, theta bar, theta bar, equals to one. Okay, these are just essentially conventions the, for writing integrals in a simpler way. Just instead of writing d theta one, d theta two, and all that, I just put d2 theta, and we know what it is. And this will be useful when we talk about uh, 
functions of that. So I think I will stop today here. Uh, sorry, there's one extra equation. If you, you allow me. If you allow me to write this extra equation, so I, I will finish this part, and then I will start talking about superfields on Monday. Then d2 theta equals one quarter epsilon alpha beta d by d theta alpha d by d theta beta. So this is the extension that the derivative and the integrals are the same. For the theta bar, there is a change of sign. Sorry about taking this time. So, okay. So this we'll finish the the the, the formal definitions of these uh, properties of of, of uh, functions of thetas, and uh, then now I will start. We have all the information now to start writing what a superfield is, and we'll start with that on Monday. <laughs>